Welcome to the Virtual Recruiting Summit. I am your host, Neil Leibovitz. I will be with you for two days. I want to thank you all for joining us. Please make sure you check on all of your trainers' links and click on their LinkedIn and connect with everybody. And uh, we have, again, an exciting two days. You can find the agenda under the Topics and Agenda tab. And I want to make sure that you are all aware. You've probably seen it plenty, but we do have a great upgrade opportunity. Don't worry, there will not be many commercials at all during the summit. Uh, But for those of you who can't make all of the sessions or you would love to have this stuff, we still have a ridiculously low price for upgrading now during the summit for only $189. That goes up to $499 as of tomorrow night. You get the MP3 recordings, the PDFs, the handouts. You get to watch the webinars as much as you want over three months. So you can watch it many times. You can share it with your teams. Uh, You could take great notes. And again, just the handouts themselves are great which if you go to the Upgrade Now tab, you can do that. And you can also just buy the handouts if you really want to follow along at home, even though you got this great webinar. So let's get right into it, everyone. This is a great topic, mastering your niche. And here's the thing. The thing about the niche is this can literally double your billings, double your temp margin, literally. It can triple it. It can quadruple it with some work. So I feel it is the most important session you can ever go to. That is why I put that in the uh, marketing that you guys all received about this. And I'm really going to explain that in detail for you. Okay? So the first thing that I really want to do is beat to death beat to death the concept so that you're all bought into it and when you get off the phone or off your computer today you start an action plan and you need to do that listening to a webinar is great but without execution it's not going to do you much good but i know you're here because you all want to do something but you know here's the thing that i see constantly Okay, the niche is a, 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 frankly, it's a word in our business that's really only been around for about the last 10 years. If you want to go way back to our industry, everyone was a generalist, right? Back in the 1910s and 20s and 30s, and hey, picture, you know, like the black and whites with everyone walking around with scarves and shawls and, and hats, right? Like Johnny Dangerously, everyone wore hats back then, right? Back then, they had job shops, they had employment agencies. Right, and they were generalists. Well, that went on for decades in the birth sort of of our industry. And then what happened? Well, think about it. What happened was in the year, frankly, 1946, there was a pioneer, a guy by the name of Bobby. And this guy decided that, you know what, I'm an accountant. Not me, but well, I am actually, but Bobby. He's an accountant. And hey, let's, let me specialize in accounting. I think because I'm a specialist that, uh, boy, things can go a lot better for me. Well, that guy's name was Robert Half, and he started this business in 1946. And let's just say that the rest is history, okay? Now, that was the birth of the specialty firm, finance, all right? Now, what I want to hear from some of you, and you guys can just, why don't we put this in the, in the chat box, Okay. So in the chat box right now, let me hear some reasons, okay? Um, Why do specialty firms do better or why do people tend to place better than generalists? What are some of the benefits? Guys, don't be shy. Start typing. This is going to be a very long call. Interactive. Come on. Chat. Not question box. Chat box. Come on. You're all there. We got lots of people on this call. (laughs) Come on. You're making it make this hard for I'll give you all the answers, but I think it's a lot more fun when we interact. All right, fine. I, this is amazing to me. Seriously, we got like over 50 people on this call. Okay, that said, 
Um, some of the things that normally come out in the boot camps is, well, think about it. Well, specialists make sense because your focus is more limited. So you can get much better. And that was Bob Half's original concept, right? I'm gonna, I know accounting. I'm an accountant. I know that much better. Therefore, boy, by definition, the quality of my people are going to be better because I know how to screen better, right? So he knows how to screen. So, all right, that's awesome. That's one of the reasons. Well, I'm going to get a better reputation. I'm going to get better expertise, right? Generalists have to specialize. Well, not specialize. They have to focus on, I don't know, 30, 40, 50, 60, 80, 100 different positions. It's not that specialists are any smarter in our business, but specialists only have to focus maybe on 10 positions or 15 as opposed to 1,500 or 150. So again, your expertise is going to be better. On the same note, why do specialists get better candidates, even if they're, they have the exact same sourcing skills? Well, the answer to that one, right, is it's a volume game. It's a numbers game. If all I'm doing is trying to find and network with the best 50 people, and all I do, again, let's use Bob Half, I'm, all I do is uh, accounting, I'm going to find 50 of the best accounting people I can. If you're a generalist and you're finding the best 50, you might have two accountants in there. So by definition, when someone comes to me as a specialist or to, to, to Bob, Bob's going to have better people for them, right, by volume and by definition. So listen, I don't want to – this is going to get much more exciting than this. Don't worry. You're, some of you are saying, oh, my gosh, did I just lose my money on this? No, don't worry about it. I'm just giving you the backdrop, if, if you will. Okay? So – my point to all this is I'm certain that everyone on this call buys into that. I'm certain that everyone on this call is at least a specialist. Some of you think that you're in a niche, and what I'm going to tell you is that your niche is probably just a specialty. Everyone is specialized, okay? Those that aren't, there are some general service firms, okay? They're massive. Where I used to work, I was a global president of a DECO, $25, $30 billion company, sure. And they have a very different model, right? Very different delivery model and a different economies of scale and cost structure. So everyone is a specialist. And frankly, it's not the same anymore because everyone is a specialist. And my point is today's specialty firms are similar to what the generalists were of yesterday. So if you bought into jumping and making the move, from a generalist to a specialist, why haven't you made the leap to go from a specialist to a niche player? Or why haven't you made the leap from going to a, uh, from a niche player to a micro niche or from a micro niche to a hyper super micro niche? Okay, and I'm, again, I'm going to explain what the niche is. All right, but the point is, just like uh, a general business was incredibly inefficient and very counterproductive, right? Same way, the specialty niche is going to be that relative to a true niche right, or a specialty. Now, when I normally go around the room, okay, and I ask for billing levels, we'll start with anyone that does general lev uh, general service or we'll even take, you know, administrative, whatever. Okay, now, I'm just going to deal with PERM for the purpose of this call, direct hire. But normally what you'll get is I ask, what do you consider a big biller? What do you consider a big biller, you know, in your company or in your world? And in a general service firm, that answer, and you think what you think that answer is, that answer is typically $150,000 to $200,000. And what do you consider a good solid biller in your world? And in general service, the answer is $100,000. You do $100,000 in perm billings in general service, you're considered good. Okay? Now, People that are in specialties, again, that could be the world where I came from, finance, IT, these are just specialties, right? Legal. What do you consider to be a big biller in your world? And the number I hear eight times out of 10, and, and again, I'm sure eight out of 10 of you on this call right now have thought about this number, think about it, and the survey says 300,000. 300,000 is considered a, a big biller. Again, I'm not saying that we, we know that there's much bigger billers, but that's considered, right, that guy's really solid. What do you consider a good biller? And they'll say, you know, 250, 200, 250, right? So again, you're looking at, 
double really what you have in the general service world. And why is that? Again, it's not due to the level of the person or their skills. It's due to that inefficiency in everything that we've talked about. Okay, well, you ask a niche player, someone that is very, very specific, and what do they consider to be a big biller, truly a big biller in the industry? And the minimum answer you'll hear there is three quarters of a million dollars. Okay, they, you know, some might say 500,000, and I'll give that, but um, because it's tough to do 500 without doing this, but some people do. But 750, you cannot do that level. You can't do 657. You can't do it without being in a very specific niche. And the, the, and the good ones, okay, the good ones, the real big billers, the top ones there, do over a million, million and a quarter, 1.5 million in direct hire. Isn't that nuts? There are some of you on this call that are going to struggle to do $200,000 this year. And I'm telling you, the big players that work in a hyper niche do eight times that amount. And just as I am telling you, look, let's not look at the best of the lot, but let's look at the people doing, let's just say 800,000, which is a number that a true niche player should easily be able to pull off, let's say $700,000, okay? Why aren't you doing that, okay? And you can do that by following what I'm going to share. And this, again, is a compilation of what everyone's doing. There, oh, everything I'm going to teach you on this call is what all of the top billers in the industry are doing. And it isn't rocket science, right? It does require a strategy that I'm going to share with you, and it does require implementation. But again, this isn't hard stuff, but you need to do it, and you need to make a shift, and it does require some discipline for sure, okay? So let's take a step back. I said I'm going to beat this to death. We love analogies in our business, right? We love war analogies, and obviously you've heard lots of medical analogies, right? Lots of analogies um, about um, doctors and all that sort of stuff. So think about the medical industry, okay? And it's very similar in lots of ways to ours. You have generalists called internists, right? Not someone who interns, but internists call them generalists, you know, general practitioner, right? They're the, the uh, in HMOs are the first doctor you go to, your primary physician, um, very smart people, okay? A lot of them, or I'd say all of them, and granted, they, they run the gamut. So there, there's people that generalize, and they got to get good at everything, just like our general service. I'm going to stop making the obvious analogy. When, I, when we're talking about generalist, specialist, and niche, just like in our world. Okay, you then have specialists, right? So these are people that specialize in orthopedics. They specialize in ear, nose, and throat. They specialize in ophthalmology, the eyes, right? And then there's hyper-specialists. And again, I'm going to put that off for a minute, and we're going to get into that. Let's just talk about, again, specialists. Why do they get paid more? And you know what? They do get paid more. They get paid more by you, and they get paid more by the insurance companies. The insurance companies will approve and will pay what they consider to be the reasonable standard. And as you know from your years of having medical issues, some of us more than others, you know that they charge more. Okay? So we need to talk about it, and we need to think about that. Okay, so for one, I want you to look at what goes on for the generalist. They've got to be good at every medical issue whatsoever, right? They've got to know how to treat a sore throat. They've got to know how to treat an eye infection. They got to know how to find out if a bone is broken or if there's ligament or what tests they need to run, right? They need to know everything. So when the online journal of medicine, and it has been online for a while, but when the journal of medicine comes out with new articles or Harvard, uh, you know, puts out a, uh, you know, a whole new study, the general practitioners need to read everything. Now, granted, if they feel comfortable and they know a lot, they'll move on, but they've got to read every article that comes out on that. Now, what happens with a specialist, right? A specialist that's dealing with an eye, all they have to do is deal with issues that have to do with the eye. So specialists, again, one generalist to a specialist, no one's smarter than the other. In fact, my brother is a physician. He started, in fact, I'll give it to you, my brother started as a generalist. 
okay? And then he moved and he decided he wanted to switch niches and he wanted to become a specialist and he became uh, uh, an anesthesiologist. Let me just say, he works a lot less than he ever would have worked there and makes a lot more money now and he's the same smart person that he was in the other job, okay? Point taken. And had he not made the move, he'd be a classic example. My brother was a physician's assistant, or is actually, my other brother, and he worked for a general practitioner, and he decided, uh, based upon my brother's move, that he ought to go in and be more specialized, and he is now a PA for dermatology, and he makes double the income. Well, because so does the business practice, okay? So, again, these specialists only have to focus on their expertise in that one area. They could really become an expert on the eye. I mean, you're impressed when you see an eye doctor, but that's all that they read about, just like all you're going to read about is your niche, okay? Um, now, uh, uh, all right, what happens once uh, an expertise is established? Once you, you know, uh, prove to someone that, wow, I solved the problem that someone else didn't, i.e., you give them good candidates that the generalist couldn't or the specialist couldn't when we look at a hyper niche or a very specific niche situation, you just get a natural reputation and over time, and it could be pretty instantly, but over time, you are going to get a lot more referrals. Okay, you'll be known for that specialty. Okay, let's talk about true specialists now. Let's talk about real niche players because all I'm giving you now is still what most of you are in. So what happens when you go up the ladder, if you will? And, and again, let's not even say up the ladder because the more specialized a physician gets doesn't make him smarter. Okay, so let's call it a threshold. Picture a, an X-axis, right? A, a, a horizontal threshold, right, or a spectrum. And all the way at the one end, you have the generalist. All the way at the other end, you've got the hyper niche, our business or medical. So what happens when you go up in medical? Okay, so let's look at an example. So you can have a general doctor, and okay, many people go there if their knee's bothering them or if they, you know, have an accident when they're playing tennis or working out or whatever it is, okay? Um, I never, ever, ever, ever go to a generalist, ever, okay? Some of you have to with your insurance, but I never, unless it's just a sore throat, something really basic, I want to get a culture, I mean a physical blood work, right, ever. Anything specific, I always go to a specialist and try to find the most detailed specialist I can. So, of course, when my knee went out, uh, it was in uh, 2004, it was horribly, horribly painful. I was working out on a Stairmaster. I, and my knee just gave out. So I went to uh, uh, an orthopedic guy that I had known, you know, really from the past. Some other people went to him. Really, really good guy. He tried everything he can. Now, the good news is he knows the, you know, uh, all, everything about the bones, right? And uh, I mean, that's what orthopedists do. So he gave me all sorts of tests. He, you know, well, I think it's this. Let's try this. Let me, uh, you know, uh, order these, this MRI. Uh, boy, I wouldn't see anything there. Let me inject you with cortisone. I think it's going to be here. And anyway, I uh, didn't help. So I went to a friend of mine, that's an orthopedist. I normally don't like using friends, but I was getting exasperated. He, you know, did a couple other different things that was encouraging, but at the end of the day, wasn't able to solve my problem. Still had knee problems. So one day, I'm at work, and I'll just call the guy Jeff, that's his name. Jeff, uh, you, know, you know, finds out, I was like, man, he knew, knew about my knee, and he saw me sort of walking a little funny. He's like, and he used to be a finance guy for the NBA, uh, which actually is headquartered or was headquartered at least in New Jersey. He said, Neil, you got to go to this guy. Um, he is a, all he does is knee uh, related sports injury. Okay, understand his niche. He's not only an orthopedist. And he took it a level higher, and he became an orthopedist that deals in knee injuries, and knee only. Okay, let's say so knee only. Then he dealt with an orthopedist that deals with the knee and knee injuries that were sports-related. How do you like that? Very specific. Okay, so, and so that's all that the guy does, all that he does. And uh, he was the uh, physician for knee injuries for uh, the New Jersey Nets, 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 lovely, for the New Jersey Nets. And of course, he also had his own very successful practice. This guy's waiting list, six months <laughs> for a knee injury. Now, granted, that's for new patients.
Okay, so Jeff made a call for me, and basically he got me into the guy. Now, I'm telling this story very fast because, uh, uh, you know, I, I think you all sort of get the concept of it. But here's what was, was unbelievable. So, A, and this happens in specialists, too. When I go in to ask about insurance beforehand, what do they tell me? Oh, no, no, no. We don't bother with insurance. You deal with the insurance. We'll give you, a, you know, your diagnosis and you deal with it. You know, basically, we don't want to be bothered. In other words, no, we don't want to be bothered with 20% fees. We, we take a part retainer up front. Or we, we, no, 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 no. We don't discount our fees. We only work at 35%, right? You'll get some coverage on it, but you're going to deal with it. And you've all seen this. You see it with plastic surgeons. You see it with, with tons of people. Why? Because they can. Why? Because they have a huge level of expertise, and if you want it, you need to pay for it. Now, again, don't forget, in our business, it's still contingency, right? So even if you say, well, we're not the same as medical, all you're trying to do is say, look, just see my one person and see if I'm full of crap or whether I truly am the knee sports injury specialist. And again, you can use this story, by the way, an abbreviated version, of course, um, you know, for, for your clients. So... Um, I had to pay. There was a, a, a huge line. This guy got tons of referrals. And so I go in, and it really is an amazing story. Again, not that this guy's so friggin' brilliant, but literally his waiting room's packed. He finally brings me in. I get greeted by the PA. The doctor then comes in. The man spends about three minutes with me, and he solved my problem. Okay? He's like, let's go. All right, talk to me, Neil. What do you got, buddy? I explained it, this and that. All right, so it happened on a uh, treadmill, okay? So, okay, so repetitive motion. You're going up, show me how you do okay? You lean forward, you lean back. Nope, this is my method, okay? Where does it hurt? Well, nope. Well, you know, they tried this, doctor. No, no, cortisone's not going to do it. He goes, here, puts his hand on my knee. He says, okay, your problem is this, Neil. Um, due to the re repetitive motion, your kneecap actually became off track. Because if you feel right here, Neil, this, this muscle on the side of your thigh, and actually right outside of it, there's this band. It's called the iliotibial band. And you feel how tight that is. And you notice when I ask you to stretch and move down, your hamstrings are really tight and your calves are really tight. So what ends up happening, and he just explained it to me in three minutes. So it's off track. That's why, Neil, cortisone doesn't work because it's nothing to do with that. It's going to continue to rub. The, the cortisone's not going to stop the inflammation of your kneecap being. That's why it doesn't show up in an MRI. You need a special type of MRI, which we can do. It's expensive. We can do it, but here's how I think we can solve it. All you need to do is you're probably going to need about a month of physical therapy. I need you to stretch every single day. I'm going to leave you, and my uh, PA is going to come in and give you the three main stretches you need to do. Don't minimize this. It's not like the blow-offs you used to do. This is going to fix your knee problems that have been plaguing you for years, okay? This is what you need to do. And bottom line is um, your knee is going to go back on track with the, the physical therapy. And it did within two weeks. Within two weeks, my problems were solved. Now, why? Again, because this guy, that's all that he focused on. That's all that he specialized in. And he charges through the roof. He charges full fee. What do you think happens? What do you think this guy does? And he's, of course, rich as can be. What do you think happens if I was in there and I said, okay, Doc, why well, have you? Um, my arm hurts. I've been playing tennis. And uh, I think I got tennis elbow. Now, might he give me a quick free, here's my quick tip for you? Sure. Is he going to diagnose my tennis elbow, a guy that only specializes in sports-related knee injuries? The answer is a big, fat no. Why? Because, again, if he did, he's not going to be as good as that as he is with the knee. He's going to lose some of his reputation. No one's going to want to go there and start spending more out-of-pocket money or higher deductibles or your insurance company only approving X amount because he's too expensive if you can get the same exact thing somewhere else. And he's going to make less money. He's going to have less expertise. Okay, so again, it's the same thing with your business. And you need to be as specialized as a sports-related orthopedic sports injury knee doctor. And that's really the key of where we're going to go. Okay? So to come up with your real niche what a real niche is is obviously not just a specialty there are four main areas that you need to look at and think about with your business 
Okay, so you can have a, a specialty, and each of these are really specialties. You could specialize based on a function, right? I specialize in accounting, a legal, sales, HR, right? Whatever. Or you could specialize on a vertical, a sector, right? My specialty is manufacturing. My spec, uh, specialty is uh, uh, pharmaceuticals. My specialty is financial services, right? Healthcare, consumer goods. Okay, that's again a vertical, it's a sector. You can specialize on ge geography. I specialize in placement within uh, New Jersey, within Bergen County, within Paramus. And again, you see that certainly with uh, uh, general service firms too. Or, hey, levels. People out there, what's your specialty? I do C-level, right? Oh, I do entry-level positions. Okay, so each of these at best are a specialty. Okay, and again, I say at best because geography probably alone, I wouldn't call that too much of a specialty. But I go around the room in my boot camps and I, clients and anytime I deal with recruiters and they ask questions, I'm like, what's your niche? And they'll say finance. And I'm like, it is not a niche. Again, hence why you're on this call. That's a specialty. Okay, great. You're an orthopedist. Okay, but there's, you don't have a niche in there. Okay, right. And again, I, not to beat to death the doctor thing, but where are you going to go, really, if you have cancer? Right? You're going to find the best person that specializes in that cancer. And, in, you know, in, in that case, and it used to be that this analogy didn't hold true between medicine and us. But, hey, in that case, you could have a Mayo Clinic sort of in the middle of nowhere. You can have a doctor based out in Nebraska that was world famous because all he does is focus on this one type of uh, strain of leukemia for kids, right? And that's where you're going to fly your family out to. Well, of course, when you're dealing with the health of your child, you're going to spend whatever money you can and fly out. Well, now with the internet, of course, and the fact that we're national businesses and, and in the hyper niche, you should be a national business, which we'll, we'll you know, talk about, Right? It's easy for you to access anyone ever, anywhere and fill positions anywhere and recruit candidates anywhere. Okay, So it, it really is uh, you know, very, very much the same, and you just need a niche big enough. But again, you've got doctors that make a ton of money by being great at just one really oblique, obscure sort of disease, but anyone who has it goes to that person. Okay, and not that others can't research it or find it, all right? just like recruiters can do other things, but they're the one that you're going to want to go to. Okay. So, again, any of these things are your specialties. So what you need to do is try to pick as many of these as you can and add them together. The more you add, the better your niche, meaning the more economies of scale. And, again, we're going to talk about economies of scale and why this all really works besides just this great buildup. Okay, so... Um, now look at some of the examples that I have, okay? So not only do you want to be accounting, okay, that's great, but you want to deal with types of positions. So we're going to add level to it, and that's going to be credit analysts. And the sector is going to be in financial services, and on top of financial services, we're going to add banks, and on top of banks, we're going to make it a commercial bank. So credit analysts for commercial banks. Uh, we don't just do IT, we do web developers. We don't just do web developers, we do them in Florida. We don't just do them in Florida, we do them in Miami, Florida. Right? We don't just do um, uh, uh, you know, the financial industry, we do the insurance industry. Within the insurance industry, we do actuaries. With, within actuaries, we only deal within the life insurance sector, or I should say within insurance, right? So... If you have any, you know, neat specialties, you want to type them out in the chat box, live it up. You guys seem a little shy about chatting, and I know webinars are nice and anonymous, and you just want to get your info and do your thing, but uh, feel free to, to type it in. Um, but, you know, again, when I do a boot camp of about 30 people, I normally get one person, seriously, one that has what I would call, you know what, yeah. And they'll still benefit from this stuff. So my hunch is there's one or two of you only on this call that even have already in place at least the name or the concept of what you want to do. Um, I want to give credit to this next story to a friend of mine. He's a trainer in the industry also, a guy you probably heard of by the name of Jeff K. Uh, Jeff and I have worked pretty closely together over the years. And Jeff tells me the story. He's trained on the story. But um, 
you know, we, I went out to visit his uh, company, K Bassman, which has just an oodles amount of million dollar perm billers. And they all do this stuff also that we're talking about. And so, you know, I, I asked if I could spend time with the people, pick their brains, do some interviews and stuff like that. And, you know, Jeff always tells me the story of, you know, a great example of one of the most successful guys that uh, they ever had. This guy's niche was real estate. Neil, that's not a niche. I know I'm teasing. His niche wasn't real estate. His niche was commercial real estate. Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm missing some. It wasn't just real estate and commercial real estate. It was real estate, commercial real estate, high-rise development. Oh, I'm sorry. It wasn't just commercial real estate, real estate, high-rise development. It was in Florida. Oh, no, I'm sorry. It wasn't just that. It was in Miami. Oh, I'm sorry. It wasn't just that. It was in Broward County, right? So the niche was Broward County, commercial real estate, high-rise development. Now, he actually had an informal niche, which was more um, the project on up, but he would deal with anything because his network was so tight in there. So anything that had to do with high-rise development in Broward County, that was this guy's niche. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. Well, where was he a couple of years ago when the market fell out? All right, well, we'll save that for some Q&A later, or you know, we'll talk about that. But for now, think about that. Well, there's so many recruiters that do real estate. Is a niche big enough? He became the guy that anyone would do it because, for one, he didn't just wait for his reputation to be established. He made sure he shared his reputation with everyone. He made it clear to everyone he dealt with that all that he does is this niche and spread the word. All I do is commercial real estate high-rise development in Broward County. It's all that I do. Now, what I get into a bit later, and you'll hear me mention a couple of times, is that this does wonders for your marketing nonsense. I don't mean nonsense. It's important, but the, the nonsense you have to deal with within it. Your objection handling. Oh, we're happy with the agencies we deal with, Neil. Uh, yeah. But I'm the only one that deals with commercial real estate, high-rise construction, and only in Broward County. And again... The more specialized you get, the more you're able to be an expert on it, just like in medicine. The more you're able to read about everything, the more you're able to get the right RSS feeds, write the right articles, research the right things you want to do. When you hear a word, you make time to find out what it is because that's all that you need to focus on. So you use that information in all of your marketing calls. And again, I'm going to give you some examples, but... Um, you just, again, want to spill out that you are the complete expert in this. And, you know, what, what he would do if he got objections or when he's talking to everyone, he could spit in a second. Listen, I hear what you're saying, but, um, uh, or I hear what you're saying about the fee, but here's the bottom line, okay? There are 32 high-rise construction projects going on right now. Okay. Last year, there were 23 that were completed, and there have only been 52 in the last five years. This is the biggest year that we've had for it. Out of these, half of these are at least 80% completed. Okay, And so we have a couple of good people that are now coming on the market, but they're impossible to find because they're not going to abort their projects 80% done. Okay, There are 82 companies in the U.S. that can deal with this. There are six of them. Okay, that bring people, right, you follow what I'm saying? It's not, oh my God, I'm never going to know all that stuff. How am I going to call it? Of course you would. It's not hard because that's all, I mean, you guys could find that out right now. In, 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 in a half hour, you can get unbelievable research on the marketplace in Broward County high-rise development by Googling it, right? He just does that, spits it out, and obviously you don't have to Google it over time because you know everything going on. That's how you establish yourself as the expert. That's how you ask them to make sure that they know that you're the expert. You're not shy about talking about it, but you sort of laugh when you get an objection that someone says, oh, you know, we're already dealing with uh, ABC specialty firm. Awesome. What does your niche look like? Is it a niche? And again, I'm telling you from how many, I've done this over and over and over and over and over again. This is not my first time in this rodeo. All right, over and over and over. All right, so I do see a question is is risen there. Ramona, 
Uh, you are unmuted. Ask your question. Ramona, you there? Uh, can't answer because I don't have a mic. Oh, no, I hear you. You're fine. Go ahead. You do hear me? I do. Oh. Oh, well, my question is, you asked about niches. Would accounting, uh, high level, C level, would be considered in diversity? Would that be a niche? Okay, good question. Would high level accounting within C level and diversity be a niche? Yes. Is it too big? We'll have to talk about that. I mean, so accounting obviously isn't. C level now, all right, you've added it on. All right, I'd still say C level accounting is massive and massive. But now you're saying within diversity positions. So that's pretty good. It still sounds like that's going to be pretty much on the big side of things. So you can always add on more. And we'll talk about how you find out how big is too big right and and how to narrow it down even further if you're starting very big and i'm going to get to that in a little bit but for starters you know what yeah i think it's decent i think it's still very big when you talk about a world like accounting and sea level but there are plenty of people that do accounting and sea level the problem is you know just like the other doctor how good are you at saying no and this is not just for you ramona per se this is this is for everybody you need to be able to say, no, I'm not going to deal with your, your arm. So when you deal with C-level, sure is tempting when they got a $100,000 uh, accounting manager or they've got a position that's not diversity. Well, hey, this is a $15,000 or $20,000 fee that I could get in my pocket. So you need to be honest with yourselves out there. All right, is that what I'm calling my niche or is that really what I'm working on? Meaning is all of your marketing and recruiting, your sourcing, your lead gathering, Everything you do only based on those positions, if you can answer yes to that, then that's a true niche. Okay? So, uh, again, this just gives you some ideas. Now, normally questions I get is, well, how do I know if the niche is big enough? And I sort of answered it about medical. You'll know if the niche isn't big enough if you never get any bites, okay? So, you know, my advice as I give you at the end, I'm going to give you a full checklist of every step that you should take, where you should go. Um, but you don't want to start too big like you're doing. You want to try to figure out what have you been hearing, assuming that you're taking what's a specialty now and you're going to evolve it. Right? You're not going to create something new, but you want to evolve it into a more detailed niche. Take a look at your job orders. Where have you been getting most of your orders? What have the positions actually been? You know, I'll say this. Before I joined ARG a year ago, and I started my training business right in the beginning, the first quarter of 2009. Talk about a horrible time to start a business, right? Or actually great time, depending upon who you talk to. But, the, you know, the worst recession ever right at the peak of it. Well, I kept, you know, selling my business, selling my business. And I get a, no, we don't have a need for your whatever. But, hey, do you have people for us? We need, you know, salespeople. We need salespeople. We need salespeople. So, no, we're not interested in training. We don't have a budget, but we need salespeople. So, again, that's a completely sort of different business. But how many times did I need to be beat over the head till I say, you know what? I better find a solution for salespeople for these guys. And I did. And I made more money on my first year doing placements than I did on training, which is pretty funny. So where are they telling you to go? And that's where you need to listen to. No, nope, sorry, we don't have any needs for any minority people at C-level. But hey, what do you got uh, you know, for financial analysts? What do you got for financial analysts? What do you have for financial analysts? Um, or no, we don't really care if they're minority at this uh, position, but sort of anyone there, whatever the case is. Okay, so they will, will, will sort of tell you and you're going to get an idea. But look at your job orders and where are they? Where are most of them? Okay, and then... Um, uh, that's a good place to start, and as I'm going to get into, you want to constantly source for leads, constantly source, and and people will then tell, where are these people interviewing? Where are your candidates that you're networking with going? And treat that just like a client asking you if you have people for them in that, in that exact position. So as you're networking with your candidates, you got to get in the habit of always asking them where they've been, and I'll, I'll talk about that again in a little bit, okay? So any more questions so far on at least the criteria for a niche, right? Um, and again, I'm going to clear the hands. Ramon, I don't know if you have any more. Anyone else or anything else there? Just raise your hands and we're going to keep on going, okay? Okay. So um, here's an example. 
Um, and again, just to show you how the math can work, that when you're the expert, you can have a very small niche. And this one is saying, let's just assume you have a market and it has 20 widget makers, okay? So 20, and your, and your you know, widget makers is your uh, niche number. The specific is a very specific type of widget, very small niche. There's 20 widget makers at 50 companies, right? So 50 companies in this space, right? So that means there's 1,000 widget makers in your world. Let's say, in terms of job changes, you've got 10% attrition, right? Employee turnover. Um, attrition, as they call it globally. I know some of you are in Australia and the UK and, uh, and Canada on this, so uh, and which is low, by the way, right, 10%. And then you say you have 5% growth in that. Okay, so when you look at all this together, you do the math, you know, okay, well, we're going to have 150 potential job orders, right, total new positions or, or, or job orders, okay? Now, let's assume out of these 50 clients, you uh, or 50 potential clients, 10 of these are your clients, right? And the rest of these or 80% of these are recruiting sources because we don't recruit from our clients. And these will be the best ones that you're going to work with, the ones that want to pay your fees, the ones that get the value of it, the ones that seem receptive to your calls, the ones that give you orders, the ones that write all that stuff that you all know about. Okay, so your sources are the other 80% of the 50 or 40. So therefore, your market potential, again, all things being equal, is let's just assume within your clients, within those 10 clients, you'll have 30 positions. Okay, let's say you get 20 of these, okay, and let's say whatever reason, you know, they're using others for it. All right, and if your average potential fee is 25, that's how you can build $500,000 in this puny niche. And this is a puny, puny, puny niche. Now, again, what I tell people is you don't have to assume that your uh, rates are going to go up. But my point is your rates absolutely will go up. You're going to get really good at the objection handling. And when you have that conviction and confidence in the niche, they've got nothing to lose by seeing your potentially awesome people at 30%, even though they're using others at 20%. Okay? So now that's just an example. Okay? Now, if you look at my third bullet on this slide, uh, what happens if you double the market? Okay? So, um, all right, uh, you will produce a million. Right, and you could easily deal with that number of job orders. Okay, if instead of fifty thousand dollar, uh, twenty five thousand dollar fees, you're doing fifty thousand dollar fees, you're going to do two million. Or if you lowered your fees, you'd do eight hundred thousand. Right, but again, this isn't made up stuff. This is how people bill. Like, you know, how on earth could someone have the time? Are they machines? How are they billing one point six million a year? This is how. It's not that there's so many job orders. In fact, they're going to likely work fewer job orders than you do. And this won't happen in your first year either, by the way. So think about it this way, okay? And uh, someone on this call who's going to be listening to the recording uh, asked me to bring up uh, what I have in my training, which is less is more. And if you're all on, if you're not on the dynamic sale training, you would have signed up automatically. Uh, when you bought this thing, I've got some great videos in there and less is more laser prospecting. Okay. And the point there is, and make sure you watch it. I mean, if you really want to learn about it, I'm not, and I'm not trying to upsell your pitch on other stuff, but I got great recorded boot camps if you like this stuff. But you know, the essence of it is, you, you know, keep your focus really narrow because you have much, and this is forget, this had nothing to even do with the niche per se. It just meant no matter what you do, you can't be calling 500, 600, 1,000 potential clients. You can't have a population of 10,000, let alone 100,000 or a half a million potential candidates. You'll never scratch the surface. You'll never really build a relationship. You'll be dialing for dollars. When you keep your focus narrow, okay, in any cold calling, and if you're a manager, I don't care what their specialty is or their general service, it's the same thing, keep your list tiny because there's accountability. You won't just leave a message. You'll make sure you get through. You're forced to have a, a, a reasonable conversation with these people and do a little research on the company and stuff, build a little expertise on it, again, even if you're a generalist, before you pick up the phone, and you'll be much more successful. So now that we marry that concept within the niche, how long would it take for you 
if you just had this puny, puny niche, 50 companies, that's all that exists, how long would it take? 50 of the biggest hiring managers. Let's say there's three hiring managers, 150 people. How long would that take? Figure it out. That's all you're doing. Forget about you have no other clients or anything to deal with anymore. I don't know. If that was your focus initially, a month, would it? A couple of weeks? A quarter if you're really slow? And a thousand candidates. If you wanted to talk to everybody so that everyone in this niche knew you, everyone. Now, again, if this is a much bigger niche so that the key players knew you or whatever you want to do, how long would it take to talk to a thousand candidates, right? Think about it. How long would it take? What is that? Uh, 20 a week? 20, 40, 60, 80? Yep. 20 a week for a day. All right, if you wanted to work slow, you'd do that in a year. If you wanted to do it fast, you'd do it in four to six months or three months if you want to do it fast. My point is not long, right? Normally people tell me, you yeah, know, I could, if this is all I was doing and I was going to focus, I could knock all of those off with my focus in a quarter, three to four months. So A, that's how you determine whether your niche is too big or not. Can you get regular call frequency? And I'll give you examples of that also later so that you don't just have to take you know, copious notes. By the way, don't you love that? The word copious, I have never heard it used. Actually, once I have. You never hear copious without the word notes following it. It's like it's the only word made up to go with notes, right? Seriously, copious notes. Okay, that's going back to high school. So it wouldn't take you too long. How long would it take you to recruit everyone in this space and recruit the top graduates from widget making school? right? We just went through that. Not too long. Okay. And that's the point. You just want to be able to talk to these people and you're going to have, look, we're, I'm not teaching you how to do the business at all, right? We're not talking about any of the stuff that they always talk about, which I always talk about when I train people. This is strictly on economies of scale and efficiency and building an expertise. Of course you're going to know the great widget maker that has exactly this. Of course if you're talking to these people, you're going to know what's going on in the industry, the latest things, what they're being trained on, what systems the companies are moving to, and quoting great things. Of course you're going to have great references of, look, I'm, only, I'm not going to work with you. Listen, um, I only deal with widget makers. Um, Steve at Acme Widgets, which by the way, I, I just, I love the whole, okay, whatever. Spacely Space Rocket Widgets, right? You'll be able to name drop these great companies because that's all that you're dealing with, right? All that you're dealing with. So, you know, and, and again, you can look at the graphic on here, and this is just what I've been talking about. So I don't think I need to really walk you through the orange and all the way down to slicing it out, right? But now you can see how you can get a really, really tiny niche. What I'm going to tell you is this concept is not unique to recruiting. The concept of uh, the niche and micro niche has been the, at the forefront of the internet and for internet marketing. Right. I mean, if you wanted to start a website on phishing, forget it. You're not going to make a dime. If you wanted to sell a book on phishing now, forget it. Join the club. Right? Go on Amazon or whatever. It'll be 3,000 books. All right. Trout fishing. Um, all right. You'll definitely do better. You know, those who want trout fishing will read you as opposed to regular fishing. Freshwater fishing. Okay. Um, you know, I'd say probably similar to trout. Freshwater fishing in Africa. Right? So, hey, people that want to go to Africa and, and fish in fresh water will buy your book. And the irony is it's a much smaller population, but you're going to make a lot more money. These will be people that will pay for your website. They'll pay for your book. They'll pay for uh, documents that you have, tools. They'll click on your links to go and buy fishing rods from you as opposed to someone else. Right? It's counterintuitive, actually, because you would think, wow, the smaller my niche, the better off I'm going to be. Right or the bigger the niche is, rather, right? Because again, the funnel. You got to forget funnel theory, which is what's been ingrained in all of our heads, right? And just you know, you picture that funnel. It's a giant opening. Put as much into it as you can and shake out what you can get. It's ineffective and it's inefficient. So start small, as I said. Where again, I already told you where you see most of the business. 
Okay, that's a great way to go. Or where the candidates and the leads are telling you where the business is and where you're most excited. Okay, and yeah, you can use some knowledge that you read. Wow, I, I've read that this area is really steaming up. You know, for example, those of you in IT, you don't have to wait until cloud computing becomes big. It's already one of the fastest growing now, but I've been talking about this for IT people for the last year. Cloud stuff is huge. Mobile applications, of course, aren't going anywhere, just going to get bigger. So you can get a very specific niche there. If that's what you're excited about, yeah, you can use that even though, you know what, I haven't had too many cloud job orders. It's just because you've been fishing in the wrong pond. But you can say, all right, that sounds like a pretty logical place. So you can always broaden. And on the same note, maybe in Ramon, in your case, you could always start shrinking it also using the same information that you had. You know what? I'm finding most of my stuff is in my local market. Let me see if there's a big enough market right here locally and become the expert on all the candidates locally, which brings a lot of benefits there, okay? Okay, so... You know, I keep using this word recycling, okay? So your, your expertise grows exponentially, and then you get to recycle, and you can't do that, right, in a general service world. Now, um, I want to just share, and this really does come down to focus, and it's similar to the less is more concept that I've talked about, but what do you do in a new niche, Right? And let's say it's brand new. And this is what I used to do when I would start up new offices uh, in my world over at Agilon. Um, and, and frankly, there are no trade secrets here. It's just common sense, but only common sense when you think about it because, once again, it's counterintuitive. You want to start with your smallest funnel, with your smallest. And again... Anyone that's ever trained me on it, trained me on the complete opposite, right? I was always trained on funnel theory, and then when, you know, they taught me how to open up offices, yo, we got to fill anything we can, temp and perm, and we got to make budget, and then when we make budget, then the growth could come, and it became a catch-22. You would, if you start too big, and look, picture a new office, okay? And let's just say, uh, again, you're starting brand new. You're relocated. You know nothing. The internet, let's say, you know, not, not what it is. And, and you're starting out brand spanking new. Well, the gut is, anytime I solicit and get an order, let me try to fill it. I'll deal with maybe narrowing it down later. But right now, I got to pay the bills. I got to hit budget. And so this is what most of my peers did when they would start up new offices. And frankly, it's not that they started too big. They just tried to start up like an existing office or an office that was regularly successful, right? They would just place every position that we placed. And so knowing the stuff that worked for me, myself on perm. Now, again, I'm not going to lie and say I used the micro niche strategy in the day. I didn't. Uh, and it's not something that was a, a, a game plan or a philosophy at all of the entire company. However, in terms of laser focus, less is more, accountability, the expertise within these people, absolutely. And I use that methodology for opening up and starting up new desks or businesses and new branches. So the long and short of it, instead of allowing, and I'll give you an example of uh, one of my offices, uh, and I became, by the way, this worked so well that it's what actually led to much of my career progression. All right, I mean, it's what I started uh, as an uh, area manager for actually Robert Half, and then I went to uh, uh, Agilon, which was AOC at the time, and I was a branch manager and also ran a perm desk. And, um, and yeah, I'd mentor more perm people and that worked great. So I could have been a really big sort of perm regional guy there. Um, but it was the temp side of the business and figuring out the whole key to this uh, office thing, which was less is more. So I turned around Long Island and I went, wow, can you do it to Boston? And, and, and I kept turning around these offices. And then in uh, uh, one of the startups I had, um, was uh, a, a, an office that just did unbelievably well. And the point is, when they came in there, they would do what every uh, one of my peers would do. We're going to fill, instead of just finance, we're going to fill data entry because we need it. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. But my point is, and especially on the temp side, but you could see it on the perm side too, it becomes a chicken and the egg, as I said, or catch 22, because you need the jobs in order to uh, uh, right, place candidates in them. But you need candidates right, in, in order uh, for the jobs to end up getting filled. 
So you would always have one or the other. So, you know, the, the fill ratios on the temp side were ridiculously low and everyone's going all over the place. In other words, it was just like being a generalist, even though, yeah, it was just finance. You're all over the place, right? You're just doing everything. So here's what I said. We're going to focus on a very limited prospect list and get our name out there. I don't want you calling anyone else, but let's just pick these, period. We're only going to work on these positions. So instead of the 25 that we normally do, these are the four. And we're going to focus on sourcing leads, sourcing, finding out where these positions are and going after them, period. That's our three-pronged strategy. Now, my manager looked at me like I'm nuts, not my manager, the, the manager of that office that reported into me. And you're crazy. We're going to uh, lose a ton of money. You're costing me a ton. And, I, and look, I expect that reaction because what I'm saying is counterintuitive. I'm not actually reducing their opportunity. I'm improving their opportunity. So yeah, I only want you focusing on when what we see now is that clients are asking largely for the accounting clerical. I, well, we, you know, I just got a, 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 an assistant controller. We don't know temp assistant controllers. So you're going to get a crappy reputation for someone who doesn't fill positions or just like everyone else. Let them know we're not doing that right now. We're going to be uh, opening up that division soon. All we do right now is accounting clerical. P accounts payable and accounts receivable and, and, and derivatives of that period. Okay, let me give you the end result so we can move on. That branch became the fastest growing and most successful startup ever, and I might argue ever may be. That branch, and um, I mean, it's old news. So I don't think it, it matters uh, terribly much, but mm, let's just say it made well over $800,000 profit in the first year. Unheard of, by the way, and, and even unheard of for a lot of branches that have been in business for five or 10 years because it was very simple and smart and we became easily known as people that are very good and then we expanded. Then it was easy. Then we were able to add staff. Then we could have more people focusing on other things. But when you start off with a branch manager and an admin person and one other person, it's impossible to do all that. So again, it's the same concept, okay? So I want you just to think about that, that less is more and your discipline and your expertise is critical. Okay, moving on. Wow, we're at the hour mark. I hope, uh, oh, I haven't really, I haven't lost anyone. Love it. Okay. So recycling, recycling, recycling. I keep bringing up recycling. This concept is critical that you understand, not only that you get it to buy into making this, this niche and hyper niche move, but so that you actually use it in your regular game plan. So recycling just basically means, right, that you get to use the same material over and over again for new placements. Just like recycling a can, you use it, you drink it, you put it in the recycling bin, it gets reused and it gets put out to another consumer. It's the same thing. You could only recycle if your focus and your niche is limited. Meaning, anything that you ever do, let's start at the broadest sense of this, anything that you ever do should be able to result in future revenue. Meaning, you know, if you're just chasing a job order, and, and I hear this all the time, oh, you know what, I really had a bad quarter because I was working on this deal with the client, it looked really good, the deal fell apart, and I have no other jobs for this type of person, I don't really place that type of person, and all for nothing. So now i got to start all over again. That's because you're not able to recycle. You want to be able to only work on jobs where your candidates that don't get placed can instantly be sent out to another client, to another job order, instantly, or as soon as the position's over, meaning, wow, I lost this deal, but I had the number two person, I'm now going to recycle them, and I already have jobs to put them into, or if I don't have a job, I'm going to now focus on recycling, and I'm going to skill market this person because this is my niche, okay, and I want these sorts of job orders anyway, so even if this candidate falls off the market next week, it doesn't really matter because I've now solicited two more job orders within my hyper niche, and it continues. If your niche is, and, and it's really easy to picture, 
if let's say your niche was ridiculously limited, let's say only one position title within your niche, which you wouldn't do that normally, right? Unless it's a bigger one. But let's just say you only dealt with this exact position. That means any job order you would ever work, except for maybe salary and benefits, would be identical, right? Or maybe the client nuances of what they're insisting on, but they're all the exact same profile, right? So that means any candidate that you have that you present to that one job order, you should be presenting to your other open four. Always. You never have to re research the other four job orders, right? You don't have to resource or start sourcing for a new job order in that world, do you? As long as you keep getting those job orders, you already have the people always by definition. If you ever run out of them, then you need to source for those people anyway. And then if you lose those job orders, it won't matter because you'll use those candidates for the next job orders that come in anyway. Right? I mean, I want that to become crystal clear because this is the real efficiency element of recycling that I'm talking about. This is what makes it super efficient. And you need to think like that in part of your strategy. So, and I'll ask people all the time, well, I'm waiting, I got two deals that might close. And, and again, I do this with all my ARG people because I'm a free consultant for them. And I'm like, all right, so let me ask them, what are their names? All right, Steve and Sally. Awesome. Where else do you have Steve and Sally on send out? Oh, nowhere. This client might hire them. I'm like, listen to me. You've got two great candidates that two different clients love and have brought back three times. Why on earth are you waiting for her to fall off the market and take another job order as opposed to getting her one that she's going to love? The client, unless they gave you an exclusive or something, it, it happens anyway. You would have done it if you had the orders. Why are you not on the phone marketing that person out? Um, you know, and you tell me what your answer is. You know what your reasons are, but they don't make sense from a strategy point of view. From a, if you want to bill a million dollars a year point of view, that's all you need to do. Every good candidate I get, I'm going to send them out to as many job order send outs as I can reasonably. I don't mean send them out to 40 of them. But you'll know over time, you know what, all I need is five regular orders like this regular. You want to send your good people out to all the five clients. That will increase you, these great candidates taking a job through you. And they'll refer people to you and they'll give you future business also, right? Again, assuming your niche isn't just that one position. Recycle. Always use them. And there's another reason why it's great. Okay? So... And this is the concept that I put in my marketing copy of this C and D clients, which some people say, Neil, what do you mean by C and D? You might call them Q clients. You might call them red flag clients. Clients when you work on the training of job order prioritization. When you get a busy desk, okay, in order for you to bill a million bucks or 800,000 or 600, whatever your goal, double your billings, okay, just so take whatever your number is and double it, you know you're going to need to have X amount of job orders that you regularly have that you're working. There's tons of training where there's too many things that you're going to have on your desk. There's not enough time in the day, and there isn't without using a recycling strategy. Because you're constantly sourcing for candidates. You try to get them in on a job. Sometimes they get it, sometimes they don't. Then you don't have the other candidates. And you're, then you're losing those. And you want to see, well, who's going to really pay? Who's worth my time of going out in the market and sourcing for, spending a day on LinkedIn? You know, uh, so I think these two, are, you don't have to do that if your niche is relatively small. Because any sourcing you do is always worth it. If not for this job, then for the next job, right? So again, I'm hoping you get that concept. If not, please ask questions before we're done with this slide. But so this concept of C or D clients becomes a non-issue. You never have to worry about that anymore. And that's a big factor. Hey, I do training on job order prioritizations. It's important, but not in a niche like we're talking about. And, and think about it. Can you, can you answer why? Do you know what that answer is? Why is that? And without reading the slides, and even if, that, even if it makes sense, why is that? Take a, think about it. The answer is because who cares? Let's give the worst case scenario. Would you believe if I were to tell you that the million dollar billers out there 
do more placements with human resources than you do? How's that for a crazy line? Okay, now let me say this. They do, as a percentage of their total orders, they don't. In fact, all, what your gut was saying is, wow, this is an eye-opener, is right. As a percentage of their total orders, they know that they want to spend as little time as they can with HR and deal as much time as they can with the line. However, if they get a call because of their reputation or in their skill marketing and they, have, and they can't do it and they get kicked up to human resources, and let's give the worst example. Human resources won't even talk to you. They're going to email you a job spec. They will not give you any feedback. They insist on you submitting a resume and email. They'll let you know if and when they want to work. Where the average recruiter has done any retraining will say, you know what, let me say, screw that. Okay, not going to happen. These guys will submit candidates. And the answer is, well, why wouldn't they? They're not going to spend any more time. And by the way, they'll spend no time on it because when you're billing uh, $600,000, $800,000, million, $1.5 million a year, uh, you can afford a virtual assistant for six bucks an hour or someone for 30 grand a year to do all your uh, little work for you, knowing how much money it's going to make you. But that said, why wouldn't they submit? Because it's in their niche. They have great people going out. Why wouldn't they submit their best for? Sure, remove the name if you want or whatever. So these people billing a million dollars a year are doing $200,000 a year out of that through human resources. Through C&D orders that you would never have time to touch because you'll go out of business. Because why not? I've got them. They'll pay it. It's going to be free money. You know, and again, you could decide even if I want to go ahead and, uh, you know, prep them as much. You know, they probably would. Right. Again, you don't really care. So if you walk through and, and you want to take notes on this slide, this is just what I'm talking about. So you can, you know, hey, you present two, three candidates, you know, or up to six. Two of them are interviewed. Again, I don't like that, though, because I say if you present three candidates, especially in the niche, they should see three candidates. And when you're a niche expert, you really don't allow, and I don't mean you don't allow because, of course, they'll eventually they get the final say. But if I present three people, and this was my view on any training, let alone a niche, if I present you three people, you need to see the three people. All right, well, let's start with these two. No. How many recruiters out there will say, oh, great, okay, I got two send outs? The answer is no, especially when you're a niche leader, an expert leader. No. Could you imagine, <laughs> I don't have a user, but could you imagine going to that doctor? He's like, listen, I want to order these tests. I want to do a, uh, uh, an, uh, uh, an x-ray, actually, a ligament, uh, and I want to do a movement MRI, and I want to do blood work. And you said, now, nah, let's just start with the uh, blood work. <laughs> and no, no. And again, I know it's a, it's a little bit different, but you get my point. These are the people I want you to see. Anyway, so they hire one. Right? We then market these people back to your good clients. Again, we're not going to market to the C&D people right, that we know of. We're going to market to the good clients. Okay, But again, we can even unsolicit send a resume to the C&D clients. If we have an order or if they, they said we don't want to work, what do we got to lose? Right? They'll even market them there. Again, again, fax guy. I, 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 don't get me started on people who still use fax machines, but email them, whatever. Okay? So... You'll still want to know your A and B clients. Yeah, these are people you're going to actually search on, and you'll do it. Um, and again, but you'll be able to utilize those people again. And C and D are people where, yes, if I got people, I'm absolutely going to send it. Are there any questions at all that we have on this? And I believe I see a question here. All right, so hang on. I think I missed some here. All right, so David, focus. You don't see a chat box. Knowledge and expertise. Well, you guys are going. Candidates ready to go. Uh, okay. Hang on there. Wow, we got a lot there. Okay. So, doesn't creating a micro niche necessitate the need to go nationwide? And this is from uh, uh, Dave. Uh, is that effective for a one-man show? And you know what, Dave? Um, I believe I didn't get to read all my emails, but I believe on my training you had asked me that question as well. I'm, so I'm glad that you brought that up. You're going to save me getting back on that. Um, yes. Uh, does a micro niche necessitate the need to go nationwide? No, it depends on the micro niche. And if there are not enough orders or leads in the way that I gave you, or there are not enough clients biting 
then you need to expand it. In your case, you did give me the example in your email that you sent to me yesterday. And I think you said there was only five companies or 15 or whatever it is. And yeah, I, could, I already showed you how even with 15 companies, you can make a lot of money. But yeah, why wouldn't you go nationwide? But listen, it's not all or nothing. Okay, there's no such thing as local and or period nationwide. Why does it have to be one or the other? There's an evolution to it. There's a threshold there also. And let me give you all an example of it. I had a client uh, that, uh, that I do consulting with, and they place only HR people, largely temp, but perm also, so HR people. And they do it nationwide. Now, HR is a, not a specialty. I mean, not a niche. It's a specialty. And they'll do anything within that. So look, I like it much better than generalist. Why nationwide? Well, because we can make more money. But as we looked at the business, more than half of it was local. And believe me, in this marketplace, it was actually in my home area of the tri-state New York area, New York, New Jersey, right? Uh, there are plenty of clients. Why would you just not be local here? Why do you think nationwide is going to get you bigger? All right, that said, they made placements elsewhere. So what we did was we just looked at, well, where have most of your clients been asking? And we narrowed it down to it doesn't need to be nationwide. It seemed like the biggest hubs and interests, at least that you have, have been, and I'm just going to you know, make up, I don't want to give away anything, but um, the, the tri-state area, Dallas, Texas, Los Angeles, and Atlanta. So focus on those four markets, all right? It could be your local market and another city if you want, or you can expand out from there. It doesn't mean that you need to market that on your business as, hi, my niche is Texas or you know uh, Dallas and New York City. That's your strategy of what your niche is going to be because you want to get to know those players, have regular follow-up, and be able to reuse them. The problem with a nationwide business, if it's too big and you're not strategic, is you can get into a nationwide chicken and the egg if people won't relocate. So I just worked in this job. This person has a position. They've got a facility out in Montana. They want me to work on it. Now I'm uncovering all these Montana candidates, and now I've got nothing to do with them. So you would have been much better off sourcing for a marketplace that could sustain, again, when you get the good people, Montana doesn't really have too many other businesses there, so what are they going to do with them, right? So you want to be able to utilize those people again. Um, so again, it doesn't need to be all or nothing there, okay? Um, and niche, sub-niche, I think we did. Even if it's a niche, can effectively do both temp and contract. David, again, yeah, absolutely, uh, and I think we talked about the temp side of it. All right, um, another question. Uh, if I create a niche in my area, most mid-sized companies only need two to three, so I need to go nationwide. Okay, how to choose clients. I think we talked about that, uh, and I'll talk a little bit more. Um, all right, do you recommend going cold turkey and doing only your niche or keep other business going as you build the niche? All right, great question. Um, no, I wouldn't go cold turkey per se, but I would stop marketing for the others, and I would finish filling them up. If you have an order that your gut says, wow, this might be a really good niche, there's nothing wrong with when you start of saying, okay, I'm going to start with focusing on my two busiest ones or my three busiest ones. And I'll narrow those down as they get busier. Ultimately, you want to try to keep it one in focus, but you can have three different niche and niche strategies that you're running like three different businesses. You just always got to make sure that you're marketing and recycling and getting the jobbers and sourcing for all three of those businesses, right? If you want to, which isn't rocket science. It just makes it a little harder to be organized with it. Okay. Copious a Greek God. That's funny. I have no idea what copious is. Okay. All right. So um, that's a concept of recyclability. Now, so, and I've been talking about this all along, you, gr you create an avalanche, an avalanche of expertise. This also is part of the economies of scale and the efficiency, right? So we already talked about reusing people. Never again will you need to recruit and have nothing to show for it. No longer will you skill market, get a job order, and have nothing to show from it because that's going to force you again. Maybe then you're going to have to source and recruit for that position, yada, 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 okay? As we already talked about, it eliminates not making money and not working with these CDQ, red clients. 
as you could see by the way that I'm talking and the way if you talk to any, and this is why I suggest go to, go to these summits and forums or, or make sure that you're involved online and, you know, set up a phone call with some of these big people because you're going to see their expertise exudes in how they talk. You will have more confidence, period. You're going to know that you know what you know. It doesn't make you smarter than anyone else. I mean, maybe you already are great, then you will be. But no, it's the same examples I've been giving. This is all that you do. You have good people. You have a candidate, for goodness sakes, that your hard to please clients love. They're bringing two people back. You then skill market them to someone else that you got a lead for that has that type of position. Or even if you don't have a lead that you know hires these type of people, and they say, nah, we're not going to see them. How confident are you going to be that, listen, dude, you got to see these two. They, my client doesn't like anyone, and they, they've been loving them or whatever. All your calls are going to be better. Like I said, your fees don't have to go up for you to make a lot more money doing this, but they will go up. Will you be able to convince someone that, listen, you're not going to get this kind of person on average from me? Absolutely. Will your client's commitment go up? Absolutely. Your reputation, again, you're not only going to wait for it to happen, you're going to constantly remind them of your good reputation and why it's so specific. Again, that's just part of what your calls are. I've given you examples. This is all that I do, right? You clearly will stand out from the crowd, even if you're the shyer type, and there are shy types of recruiters out there, even if you're the shyer type that doesn't want to toot your own horde. It, by definition, you're going to stand out. So um, I did a, a quick radio show for Recruiter Eco the other day, and they asked me this question, um, what's the biggest thing that people do wrong in a recession? And I said, well, there's a lot of things that do wrong in a session, but this one tied in nicely to the session that I was plugging. And why do people assume that in a recession, and granted, we're not in one now, but it's still not the world that all it was of yesterday, and we know the economy and everything's still challenged, and hiring is still a, a challenge overall. It's still a great market to be a recruiter, right? Why do people get this, or they got it to a degree when times were good, and then when the pie started to shrink, I meaning the market started to shrink, the pizza pie, the fruit pie, when it started to shrink, did they feel that they needed to widen their scope? Why, if you bought into this when times were great, and you said, well, things are really good now, I'm just going to focus on this because I'm too inefficient doing everything, just because it, your job orders, let's say, became half of what they were in the heat of the recession, or worse, but let, let's say that, why would the math be any different from an efficiency perspective from what we talked about? What we talked about has nothing to do with an economy, nothing to do with supply and demand. The size of the pie does. So yes, all things being equal, if the size of the pie shrinks in half, yeah, you can expect the, the size of your money to shrink. But it will shrink even more if, if you spread yourself out too thin. So yes. Your slice, you know, is going to be smaller, all things being equal, if you're trying to cut out the same portion. But again, you could be more, it works just the same, meaning your slice will still be twice or triple or quadruple what the other person is who's spreading themselves too thin, just like everything we talked about in this call. Don't be fearful ever of an economy. The only thing that normally comes up is, hey, Neil, this is all great, but what happens in an economy where things dry up when you're in a niche that's this specific and it goes bye-bye, kaput, sayonara, see you later? Well, that's a problem. And believe me, it happened to our friend in high-rise development in Broward County, Florida. Rest assured, there was zero high-rise development during the heat of the recession down there. It happened to very specific construction people. It happened to mortgage people, which mortgages back, bounce, uh, bounce back greatly, by the way. It happened to people in real estate in San Diego and Las Vegas in Miami and in Arizona. Okay, well, the answer there is you'll start getting some senses, but you want to 
you know, obviously you got to try to branch out into something new. Keep those contacts and relationships warm and keep them on your radar and stay in touch with them because that business will bounce back. When things like that happen, these candidates don't just disappear, right? They end up going into businesses that the market says can use their expertise. So mortgage people, where are they going? That's how you find out. So you start talking to these candidates. And I'd say I don't want to do too much of this on this call because I'm happy to consult with you or give you a free tip if this happens to you. But you, w find out where the candidates are going. Wow, it seems like this industry is accepting these people. And then the more places these guys are going to, that could sort of lead you to where your new niche is. And the only other tip I want to give you on that is stay close to your existing network. Don't abandon your network. Same for you who want to say, wow, I'm only billing. Hey, look, and I know there's a couple on this call who've only billed $20,000 this year, right? Horrible and a major problem, right? So you're maybe going to start something from scratch. My advice would be, where are your client and candidate relationships? What's your LinkedIn network and your other social networks looking like? And you could tap into them, meaning even if you were in mortgage when it crashed, there's still great IT people in there. And the company, if they're not folding, still is going to need IT people. So you could start there, get your good candidates, and again, ask and find out where these people are going. So I want you to, again, be the expert. And, you know, the last slides are just going to give you some takeaways um, that are going to really just summarize everything that we talked about and give you a couple of new ideas. So to be the expert, like I said, it's just going to happen by talking to these people. Follow job feeds, right? If you don't know what those are, you'll want to set up RSS feeds. I do have that in my free internet marketing training. Um, you'll get it if you signed up for my stuff. If you're too impatient to wait, email me. I'll send you the link for a webinar. Again, it's free. It's great. It's an hour long. It uh, shows you how to set them up. But again, you can get all the great web pages and articles brought right to your desktop. Okay? You'll want to quote and use these just in the example that I gave you in Florida. I already talked about the objection that we already work with someone. Uh, many of you know and try to use things like blogs or newsletters. I'll show you how to use those in the internet marketing uh, free webinar. Um, but bear in mind, don't confuse what your point is. Your blog, you could care less about what your traffic is to your blog. You're not building a blog like a blogger that's trying to get so many people that are going to click on other links and make money off of that. Your blog is to showcase your expertise. It's when you get these great articles about your commercial real estate in Broward that you're going to post it all. And then in your emails or newsletters or anytime you're done talking to a client, like, hey, by the way, I just posted an article on this. I think you're going to want to read. They go to it and you look like a genius. I don't care if you're only your, you only have eight clients and only the eight of them ever go to it. Or your eight clients or your thousand potential, your thousand widget makers, right? So what? And if they you know, only, you know, 20 a month go to it. That's what that's for. Don't, so don't confuse it. You just want to have great stuff on there. Here are other things you can do. Listen, I put this in at the last minute. Okay, I normally have this in, but this isn't what I want you to focus on. What we, what we talked about is the key things that you need to do. If you want to get business coming to you, you know, do what I'm doing. Conduct a webinar. Okay, and in this case, I'm charging you for it. Okay, so you guys already know me in order to come and pay for it, but some of you out there will hire me and have to train their staff. I give tons of free webinars, and the reason I do it is to showcase my expertise. So some of you probably found out about me originally by coming to free webinars. Great. Maybe I have five minutes of commercial, not even a 5% of commercial in there. It's great content, and now you know about me, and again, expertise. And if I was a recruiter, you'd probably call me for some searches. So again, I got that internet stuff for you, right? Uh, the newsletters, you can use video emails and social media. And again, all these, your brochures, your, your all your digital tools, posting articles on LinkedIn groups. So use this once you get set. Okay. 
I would start probably with maybe a quick blog, but you don't even have to do that if you're not technically inclined. So this is your checklist of, okay, you know what? I got this thing rolling. I now want to take this to the next level. I'm impatient. I want to be known as the expert fast. It's amazing with LinkedIn, with groups, with some quick articles, you could become an expert in three months. Let me tell you this. I put my money where my mouth is. Okay, I was super well known within the ADECO group. Okay, and within people that would see me speak once a year at the uh, uh, executive forum for staffing industry analysts. That's it. I was hit over the head hard. I had this really big ego. I realized, my gosh, this market is so huge. 99% of people out there don't know who I am. So I use internet marketing and the webinars and LinkedIn and all these things that I have on here to get myself known as an expert. I got on the speaking list for NAPS and ASA and Fordyce and you name them. You've seen me, Recorder Eco, you've seen me all over them. I did all that my first year. First year I became a well-known name in the space, okay? And you might say, well, that's great, you are the president. So what? No one knew me before that outside of there. So my point is you can use all these things to really exponentially make this happen. But bottom line is you only need to be known as the expert in the 10 people who are in your niche. You don't need all these things. So my point is less is also more with your focus and your business plan. I don't want this stuff to be convoluting and to have you lose focus, okay? Um, your skill marketing plan, um, okay, I'm not gonna do skill marketing training now. I've got that on my boot camps if you're interested or on the recorded ones. Um, but again, you're gonna just wanna have a good call that's gonna incorporate your expertise. Again, I could spend an hour on this, right? So your elevator pitch on your niche is key. Okay, and again, that'll be something like, listen, there are 250 of these companies. Out of those, 46 of them are based here. Out of those, we've got 13. There's this amount of things I know 100% of the, right? That's what I want your call to be. And you need a good skill marketing plan to be part of your recycling strategy. If you take a step back from this webinar, it's all really simple. Just recycle, recycle, skill market, to get new job orders and recruit and source to get new candidates. Always keep them within that limited world, right? Always keep them within that world and you'll always make money on them. Okay, next example I don't need to go through. It's just sort of part of less is more, but this just shows you if your niche is too big and you can't call them enough uh, uh, with frequency, then you know what? It's too big. You're never going to be able to reach them. Right, you, you don't wanna, and this goes back to should my market be national. Um, in my boot camps, I have a, a session that I call, it's, it goes with less is more, but it's called, um, uh, it, it has to do with the leads. Within it, I talk about, you know, what do you think Frito-Lay does, or Coca-Cola, or Anheuser-Busch? When they hire a new rep in the market, they don't just hire two reps for New York City and say, okay, sell to everyone you can. They figure out, you know, how many distributors do we have? How many distributors do we have in this area? Well, you know what? A normal person, if they're dealing with distributors, they can only have five distributors. So in New York, that's this market, these five distributors or this, this uh, uh, you know, half a mile radius. They back into it. They say, you know what? In order for me to sell, people are going to sell uh, Coke to the restaurants, um, you can only have the regular frequency. We know you got to probably visit them once a month. you got to talk to them four times a month. Uh, there's a room for 100 restaurants. Based on this area, this is what we should call. So, again, this is just uh, stuff that's getting a little off of this, but, uh, again, I think that's key. Okay? I already talked about this. This is just a slide. I want you to walk away from anything that isn't yours, just like just like the doctor. Develop a split network, get some money off it, refer them to someone, take 25% of the deal or for a year, okay, great. Ignore your intuition, ignore your gut, okay? This'll be the biggest mistake you can make. Learn how to say no. No, I know I can make 15 grand, but it will defeat everything I just spent on the webinar with Neil and about my niche. Try to make money off of it, or again, if you think it might be a good sub-niche, then go for it, okay? When you niche, everything you do results in recycling, results in money. When you stray off, you're going back to the game that you've been in your whole career. It seems tempting, but you have to, and that's why I opened up with, if you remember, I opened up 
And I said, you need to have discipline. I said, it's not, not hard, but you do need to have discipline. Okay? So source it. Find it. Say no. Okay? Build it. They will come. ABC. Always be sourcing. Okay. Oh, ABS. Always be sourcing. Oh, by the way. Oh, by the way. Oh, by the way. I, and again, I've told some people, Ron, I know you're on this call. I've told people, that, you know what? You got to get good. Put that on your computer. Put it on a piece of paper. Make it your screensaver. Every call you have, oh, by the way, and you try to get candidate names and client names, candidate leads and client leads. Within your niche, that's what you need to do, and you'll, and you'll follow there, okay? So that's the key. Um, all right, we've already talked about what you do now that you have the niche, and frankly, you know, uh, really the last slide that I have for you is step-by-step, step. and this is just a checklist for you to help you remember everything that we talked about in here, okay, and using all the recycling.